Happy Monday, everybody. Yo! Look at that. New week, new me. What's up? Who this? Dang right, man. like the old you. <laughs> I'm ever shifting like water, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, folks. We'll start, the, we'll start the Weird Things podcast here in just a few minutes. Check. Justin mm -hmm. looks like the photographer that tried to convince my girlfriend to take her top off. Uh, that was what I was going for. I was. Uh... <laughs> it's the, it's the, it looks like the scarf. The mask looks oh, like the God, sort of oh, the. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Scarfing it up. <laughs> I just have. Uh, yeah, it, I don't know. The mask thing on and off. And, and then you just at a certain point I just realized oh no I just I'm just gonna leave it on whatever I'm just gonna look yeah. like that guy at, who's friends with the barista rocking the uh, <laughs> chin hammock chin hammock uh no no this is the the like the, those oh got it yeah yeah little balaclavas Half yeah balaclava. one of them one of them one of them dudes yeah. uh. But then it just bunches around your neck, and you're just like a guy. Oh, oh, oh. yeah. You see from the virus. <laughs> the virus. <laughs> oh my goodness! All right, everybody. Um, well, you guys want to do weird thing? Ready? Yeah. Yeah. All right, Andrew, I'll count you in. Oh, one, one second. Oh, okay. I'll give you one sec. Oh. Ah, last second, of course. Gotta get there it. we go. Gotta get there it. There we go. Get all the get all the podcast juice out of there. Gotta clean out the podcast valve. Well, I forgot I, the the mic here. I... Oh, it just yeah, it just went out. Yeah, and it's funny, even though you couldn't hear me, I still just went silent and just went. <laughs> <laughs> like the moment, like a Skype call goes out, I'll go. You can hear me. Okay, call me. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I can hear you. It's like, all right. All right. Then okay. um, here we go. I'll count you in. In uh, three, two. Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Weird Things. I'm Andrew Mean, joined by Justin Robert Young. Hello. Mr. Brian Brushwood. Yo ho, yo ho, yo ho. Mr. Bryce Castillo. Ho, ho, ho. Oh, wait. One of those was timely. Yeah. Yeah, it's Pirate Day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, got some bad news. Uh, if you've been following what's going on with Arecibo, the telescope that's been radio telescope that's been legendary, it's been you know part of doing amazing research, and has been around for decades doing cool stuff. You know, you saw it in the movie Contact, also in GoldenEye, where it turned out to be it was a you know, secret, you know, space weapon, et cetera, but actually like legit telescope in Puerto Rico, which has done some incredible, credible research over the years. Um, its structure had been going under a lot of stress and trying to maintain it had been difficult. And a week or so ago, there was a concern that the whole telescope may collapse. And that happened. That central thing you're looking for right there in the center is, weighs about 900,000 pounds. So it's a pretty heavy thing. There are three support towers, two, towers to it. They've tried to sort of shore it up however they could, but they had a feeling that the cables they had attached to it oh! turned out not to be as strong as they thought. Oh, and... my God. It's all falling up, apart. Jeez, it did. Yeah. Look at it. Yeah, and there's a uh, drone footage too showing this as it collapses, and it's 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 kind of a big setback because uh, there is a larger telescope in China. They have a larger space telescope, but this is the world's largest was the world's largest radar telescope, which you know had the ability to be able to distance objects and do different things. That so far we don't really have that capability. It would be one of the telescopes you'd want to use if something was getting close did did i hear right I, I i have heard on the radio that it was originally intended as a radio transmitter to bounce stuff off the ionosphere and then they're all like oh wait you know what else we can bounce stuff off of planets and uh and then out to the stars they they began to look um that's that's unreliable uh because it's what i'm re remembering hearing 
there may have been an instrument or it may have been like the radar aspect of it might have been that might the radar telescope function may have been something related to that but to my knowledge it was a space telescope from the start huh. but there are other telescopes there there are other instruments there too and it might have started as a facility very much for just that was bouncing stuff around so you know why would not surprise me if there was some aspect that was you know, yeah, if I'm remembering correctly, it was it was specifically like uh, for you wanted it near the equator in American friendly military territory. Um, I, yeah, man, I I should really uh, know things before I open my mouth. Uh, <laughs> it's weird things. It's not no things. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so uh, this 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 collapsing, like I guess there's there's no real sense of putting it back together or building a replacement like uh probably not putting it back together probably from this point forward you've got to take it apart the next steps would be uh it's funding it's a matter of you know finding the money to to build this you know to rebuild and that takes you know it was national science foundation project which takes years and years and years to get stuff funding. So unless some, you know, private funder wanted to step forward and to make that happen. And I guess also like they selected know. this spot because, you know, it's a, a, you know, kind of a nice hemispherical. It was, it was the right shape. It looked vaguely like a volcano, but wasn't. And um, uh, my guess is if what you want is another t space telescope, there are many other locations that probably nowadays make more sense than to rebuild on that same spot. Yeah, it was a sinkhole, as you pointed out, and that made it kind of this nice thing because you didn't really have to excavate a lot of material to be able to pull it out of there. I don't know, really. The remoteness was a key, too, is because you're not going to get a lot of interference where it is. I think there's probably a lot of other locations where you could build this. Certainly, it's a source of pride for the people in you know Puerto Rico as far as this. It was a great you know center for science and doing really good research. You know, It'd be nice to see something be rebuilt there to do this. And uh, by the way, uh, just enough, you know, the university that had been managing it currently was UCF. Oh, look at that. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Fell apart on the Night's Watch. So the yeah, University oh, of Central Florida. Geez. Oh, it wouldn't be the first time that something from UCF collapsed in the middle of the night. <laughs> so uh, it is it is a bit hard to watch this thing happen. And But, you know, this is a... This this facility has had a tremendous amount of history to it, and it's one of these things where one of the things is, you know, it's frustrating, but over time, you know, uh, it's done a lot of amazing research. So there, so that, but who knows? Who knows so what so when it was, we, we were reading on the screen there that it was too dangerous to repair is, is part of the idea mm -hmm. that, like, you don't want to try to fix it and then break it, and you just rather see it break, or was it just, there's just no way that anybody... Like, with any tool could make it better. Uh, as I understand it, one of the cables snapped, and then at that point, it's like this thing could go at any moment. And so once it became yeah. a loaded, you know, mousetrap, then it's just like, yeah, you know. It snapped, and also it snapped below the threshold they thought it would snap. That was one of the things that was concerning, was they uh... realized these cables were not as strong as they had thought. And there's an interesting... They show the point at which one of the cables had snapped in earthquake data, where there's an earthquake in, um, let's say, the Dominican Republic or somewhere else like this, and you can follow the shock wave and see when all of a sudden this cable snapped in the telescope there, which is another one of these factors between wind, everything else. But this thing lasted like you know, like 50 years, so I mean, this thing was around before we were born. So yeah, you know, it's, it's had a pretty. It's neat also life. It's uh, one, one it of go. the very few uh radio telescopes possibly the only to ever transmit a selfie of itself because it was from arecibo that we sent the uh, message to space including a crude line art drawing of the arecibo uh telescope <laughs> yeah there's the uh like yeah uh you talk yeah like the ascii sort of people and then like when they did like like pioneer voyage where we put the gold plate on there with the man and the woman you know you're like was there a debate over how big stuff should be <laughs> <laughs> we gotta we don't want to intimidate them but we don't want to you know <laughs> so yeah that's crazy uh but you know the the upside is it it sort of brings attention back to hey these things are real these things are useful and if people are saying hey how useful are they 
I don't know. Let's talk about 2020 SO. What's 2020 SO? He says coyly. Uh, 2020 SO. That was the object we saw curdling towards the Earth. We're using our telescopes. We look up there. We see this faint object coming towards the Earth. And we're like, ooh, let's, let's, let's measure this. And there are things in space that come at us. And we can this and figure out what it is. Thankfully, there are astronomers who are able to do math and to look at this. And they charted the trajectory of 2020 SO and said, OK, what is this object? It seems really small and kind of faint, kind of hard to figure out where to come from. I'm like, huh, you know what? This may have come closer to the Earth before, like it's some sort of weird orbital pattern. NASA has confirmed the 2020 SO, this rocket, this the space, this space object, is in fact, could be <laughs> the Centaur what? upper stage booster from a 1966 Surveyor 2 mission to the moon. Holy cow. What? That's crazy. I mean, I guess it's, you know, it's gotta be out there somewhere. Yeah. So we had a booster which was used to sort of try to push this thing towards the moon and then I guess you know there was a malfunction this is back in 1966 a couple of years later a lot more moon related stuff happened and we tend to forget about these things <laughs> in the public conscious and I think it's like I'm out of here guys <laughs> you know and did a swing around and people were like hey what's this and pull it up and it's one of these objects that we I don't think we've been tracking oh, and I guess I, I guess that there, there's no uh I wonder I wonder how ubiquitous space travel would have to become before it would even be worth the effort to lean over and pick up something like that uh i guess at most you would put it in a museum i, w I can't imagine there's much scientific value to to this old engine oh well, i think there could be so this is like they say like they they figured out by trying to they looked at uh basically the spectrometer and saw that it looked like it was made of 301 steel or close to it certainly being able to look at an object like that that's been in space for 50 years and to see the impact on it to see what's happened to its structure to see you know how how many impacts of how pitted is it because it was going on a different pattern than things that we've had just in regular orbit so that's what makes it interesting is that this has been going on a much wider orbital path so there could be the problem is just it's like you know however much energy it took to get put it there you're going to need that much energy to get to there and then, you know, to try to recover plus that. Yeah. Which is, you know, hard. Um, man, I wonder, uh, uh, this is kind of a separate dire direction, but, but you know, we, uh, one of the perennial stories we talk about on Weird Things is the increasing amount of space junk. Uh, it just occurred to me that that this engine, if, if that's what it turns out to be, should we retrieve it, would be sort of an accidental space probe in that it would have been exposed to certain things that we'd be able to intuit like, oh my gosh, more or less cosmic radiation based on what we're seeing here. Or like you said, the pitting and all that stuff. Uh, I almost wonder, I wonder if in our lifetime, we're going to see a garbage collection uh, initiative with, with the side benefit of being able to sort of track uh, and, 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 and glean information from collecting a bunch of space debris in low earth or orbit. Maybe. And, and just a side note, I just saw here, one of the reasons they're able to figure out what it was is there was a suspicion it might be the Centaur booster. They aimed a telescope at another Centaur booster that we know that we've been tracking the orbit of and looked at that to see what what it looked like on the spectrometer to see what the, the you know the color patterns or the composition. And they said, OK, this is what it looks like at this point. And then they aimed it back at the other one like, yeah, it seems to be a match. Yeah, that's great. That's very cool. Yeah. So to the question about, yeah, I think that the, the goal with, let's say, SpaceX with Starship and Blue Origin, what they're working on, once you have fully reusable, fully reusable, and your cost is essentially fuel, and you're talking the price of a couple, you know, airplane flights around the world, which is not inconsequential, but is a fraction of what we pay, pay now for space exploration, Things like that start to become feasible. You know, then it comes into the you know the the, the rating, the capability of the rocket cannot reach that orbit, cannot reach those patterns, but it's much much more realistic. You know, whereas now we're like, oh, are we going to spend half a billion dollars to go grab something? It's like, well, no, we want to put something up there. But when you're talking a fifty million dollar launch, a five million dollar launch, which Starship would make possible, which is just kind of mind blowing. It's so. also crazy to know that that is such a fascinating prehistory of our current space exploration that 
we we could put something that would stay in the air or stay in, stay in space for that long, but not have tracked it. Right. That, that it's not mm-hmm. something that we were tracking. Like that's, it just kind of, uh, 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 it shows you how far we've grown. Yeah, they could on paper, you could have an idea of a window of where it would go into, but then over years, you know, that would start to change. And, and it's, how many things that we tracked? Like, I think the, you'll look online, you'll see objects in space right now. And some are even like, like lug nuts and things like this. And one of the reasons the <laughs> space shuttle flew backwards, like or tra- orbited backwards, that the first mission they went up there, the space shuttle came back down, they found like a pitting in the window and realized, oh, the window's a vulnerable spot. We should have this thing file, you know, fly backwards. So if anything hits it, it hits at the rear of it. And, you know, just as a safety precaution because you get chips of paint hitting you at 22,000 miles an hour sting. Yeah. Which is one of the scary things about a spacewalk. (laughs) Uh, Oh yeah. yeah. Boy, you're not kidding. Yeah. So gentlemen, you know, it's no spacewalk. Uh, is this show? Yeah, no, it's not a walk in the space as they say in our common vernacular, uh, friends, patreon.com slash weird things is where you need to go to support this show. If you've never heard of Patreon, uh, well, well what, the, what the hell are you doing, man? It's a great site. It, it makes uh, dreams come true, quite literally. You uh, uh, can uh, take uh, some money, give it to us, and we will make sure that this show continues to come to you. You get a custom RSS feed. It's the only way to listen to any podcast. If any podcast that you know has a, a Patreon, get it just for the RSS feed. It is so, so, so valuable to make sure you get things a little bit earlier, make sure you get all the stuff that you're already paying for uh, delivered right to the podcatcher of your choice. You head on over there, patreon.com slash weird things. So one of those things that like, uh, one of these things that keeps kind of overachieving and you kind of forget, and then all of a sudden they pop up and go, hey, I found out something kind of cool is Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. <laughs> Wait, and the, the gifts so, they keep on giving, man. Yeah, so apparently uh, the Voyager probe uh, basically just, they think that it found, a, evident, Voyager 1, they think they found evidence of some sort of like shock wave at the outer limits of the solar system, basically where it's there's some effect where the the sun hits stuff and all of a sudden there's a generation of like a burst of electrons that appear at a place where they didn't think they would. And Voyager one is apparently able to observe this. And so it's a new phenomenon, kind of a new thing we didn't know was out there. And, you know, we're a long ways away from thinking when we thought like space is just sort of empty. And you know, this is a probe that launched in like 1977. That's so remarkable still, that, that we're getting anything awesome. still from that. Yeah. It is 14 billion miles away. And it's cool because when you start thinking about like, you know, it's still extremely far, 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 far away from our nearest, you know, solar system. But you're starting at the point where it's been out there so long and traveling so far, you can actually look at like a chart of how far away it is to like Alpha Centauri. You're not necessarily head in that direction and go like, oh, I can actually see, I can actually see how far we've gone on this chart. <laughs> Which unfortunately <laughs> only makes the idea of humanity ever getting off <laughs> this, this uh, system off to another one seem like an even more daunting task because then all it took was entire lifetimes. <laughs> I would, yeah, I think, think through the approach that we're looking at of just, you know, shooting fuel out the back, burning fuel and shooting out the back. Absolutely. You know, but I think that I'm, I was skeptical. I'm less skeptical now of, I've heard enough, like, and I think I talked about this briefly. I've heard enough smart people talk about how there are ways you could have warp drive without breaking causality, you know, causing time travel paradoxes and stuff would be, be a limiting factor. And shortly, short, way short of that, like we've talked about the laser propulsion and systems like that. I'm more optimistic, and I'm optimistic now. Like we may, we may find ways to, you know, not go fast in the speed of light, but bend space in a way that you arrive there effectively faster. And um, somebody mentioned the Alcubierre drive, which was one of the things that was proposed. The problem with the Alcubierre drive, this was this Miguel Alcubierre, a Mexican physicist, proposed this idea of 
how to like expand the space behind you and shorten the space in front of you. When he first wrote that paper, the, the one thing was, is you needed something called like, you know, like a, a negative energy or negative, you know, form of negative you know, matter that didn't quite exist. And you need to fill up the entire universe. And that was the original problem. Like, well, this is a theoretical way in which you could build this system, but the problem is to have the entire universe worth of this form of matter or energy that doesn't exist. Since then, people have improved upon this. They've looked at this, they've looked, kept addressing it and look forward, you know, have kept modifying it. Now there are people who think that you could do this with a few kilograms Whoa. of a material. Mm. So a material that does not exist yet. And, but there are other people who think that you might be able to substitute other stuff because that's where it gets interesting is there are serious physicists who look at it, who don't get laughed at as much to say, hey, what about this? And it fits within relativity. It fits within there because the idea is you're not making an object go faster than the speed of light. You know, from its point of view, it's traveling at a regular distance. You know, the, the reason is there are objects, you can go fast at the speed of light, you just can't go slower. And to go to the speed of light, you need infinite amount of energy. That's the sort of thing where we, we put in those things like you can or you can't, but effectively you can't in there. But we have objects, black holes and things and everything that sort of affects and warp space around it. How would you use it to your advantage? So, might be. Um, yeah. We, uh, uh, just a just a couple of upgrade cycles away. Yeah, you know, I'm sure it'll be in iOS 15. Well, it is. It's that's the thing. When I started hearing, you know, people with actual PhDs and you know, saying, "No, there might be a way. No, you could do it like this without doing." It. I'm like, "Oh, okay," because you know, my understanding had always been that anything a warp drive was effectively FTL, and that would cause time travel. And I, I, I don't. The, the the equation start appearing it's like yeah look at this it's clear it's like yeah it's clear <laughs> obviously i think that one's smiling yeah. at me uh yeah. so that would be but that's one of these things we think about where as we move forward with ai and our understanding of things and technology and our ability to like understand how the universe works steve wolfram who did you know wolfram of mathematica etc he has a neat talk with like Lexi Friedman where he talks about the whole idea of once you understand kind of the coding of the universe, you might find that there are other ways to do things. Which Okay. I wonder Go on. <laughs> well, everything everything as we know, everything we understand about our universe is our monkey brains trying to approximate and determine it. And then we find things where like, you know, we've talked about before, like Quantum physics is good at explaining certain things. Relativity is good at explaining other things. Quantum physics, when it gets to things like gravity, not so much because it's a really good approximation of understanding it, but there are these areas where it doesn't. Mm -hmm. And then we end up in things on a larger scale, like with dark energy, dark matter, because we can observe a thing, but we don't have a way to explain a thing. Yeah. Yeah, uh, 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 thinking about the limitations of the human brain, um, uh, man, I forget the, uh, the 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 place where I picked it up, but the metaphor of think of a Windows desktop and imagine that's your only way to interact with a computer. You can come up with a set of rules that are consistent and reliable about how things move and what you click, drag, and all that stuff. And at the same time, that Windows desktop bears absolutely no resemblance whatsoever it in no way informs you about the underpinnings of how that that cpu is running or what's inside the computer or or any of that stuff i or, i say no but maybe it would be implied in so far as you might intuit that there's some kind of hard drive structure based on you know looking at directories and whatnot but uh, but but still um uh, the the fact that our brains are really only wired to see uh, a very thin slice of the electromagnetic magnetic spectrum. The fact that 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 we conceive of the world much like that uh, that desktop is a, a real challenge. Yeah, that's a great analogy, and that yeah, that's that's just you think about how we invent things like calculus because we notice like yeah, there's this relationship between this and this, and we really need a way to sort of quantify this. And then you develop a thing called calculus. All of a sudden you go, oh, I see this. Now I can predict what's gonna happen when this thing happens here and this happens there. Uh, and that you know, updated a lot 
you know, of what happened as far as our understanding of how the world worked, because it gave us new tools to do that. And then we get into, you know, general relativity was this approach towards things that all of a sudden gave us another way to realize, oh, wait, here's some formulas. And that's kind of like the way the Alcubierre drive was determined was basically uh, you can kind of plug in any sort of values you want into the equations for relativity to figure things out. And so he just plugged in a bunch of different numbers and stuff to figure out how could you build a warp drive? And it's like, yeah, it works. You can do this. If you have this here <laughs> and this there, then sure. <laughs> so, sounds good to me. Um, Screw it. So the, how, do you, how do you feel about the age of, let's say, we talked about before how Google had their their like their deep fold, the, the project to accelerate protein folding, which is exciting. We might start doing this with like the physical laws of the universe and applying systems to develop and think figure things out, but they might do it in ways that we really initially will be able to understand how they solved it, but later on it'll just be like, oh no, put a copper wire here and do this and spin around and say, my name's chicken and this happens. I mean, that's the crazy part is, I mean, already we live so much of our lives not understanding how anything happens. Um, uh, what's the analogy? Like, I can't explain to you how an iPhone is built, but I can explain to you how easy it is to use. Like uh, you touch the thing and move the thing <laughs> or whatever. And so likewise, if we get to a place where, giant mega AI farms are able to conceive of increasingly more efficient ways uh, of, of physically warping space to make it easier to get to other planets. Weirdly, we don't have to understand anything. We just have to know that it works. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, assuming we're not tearing apart the fabric of the universe, then yeah, sure, go ahead and physically mush together this amount of space so that it's a shorter trip. Why don't you just bring Alpha Centauri a little bit closer to me? Thanks, AIs. <laughs> That's one of the things I think about too. Like you just said, like bring Al Centauri close to me is our, you know, our, my monkey brain breaks down when I start to think about dimensions, when I start to think about the idea of higher dimensions, all of this, and you start reading, you know, brain BRA and E theory and the idea of, you know, how many dimensions there really are in space. Um, yeah. The fact that like after the Big Bang, all the physical laws of the universe weren't the same as now because you had so much energy, like at a million degrees, you know, a billion degrees, whatever the temperature is, things just fall apart, don't work the same way. Um, it's crazy. And, and it's based upon we test for a thing, we observe a thing, and we have this sort of thing to sort of explain it. Uh, it is... I, it's exciting to think that we'll never have all the answers. It's scary to think that we may have only just scratched the, the top of the layer of paint to all the answers. And beyond that, our brains are never going to be able to understand the rest of it. And there, there's kind of a weird comfort in that for me that when I think of the fact that we don't have to understand to enjoy the benefits of it, you know, like if the math works and, and we, you know, if the models suggest like, uh, for example, take how many things are theoretical? You know, I assume that for a long time, antimatter was purely theoretical. And then it's like, oh, we made some. And then, uh, so if the math works out and it says, yeah, what you do is you, you, you pinch the edge of Alpha Centauri, you pinch the edge of the solar system and you just, yeah, you just, you just make a little, yeah, real thin, like just push those together. Now it's only a 20 mile trip. Um, Sure, you know, if the math, if the math works out, then also have the AIs figure out how to construct whatever, you know, crazy <laughs> theoretical matter is needed to do that. <laughs> you know, there's a, there's a story there where the you know, AI have built these spaceships and stuff, and all they really are is virtual reality simulators. <laughs> and I mean, they're just hiding the other side of the moon. <laughs> I, I, to, to, to be honest, is, what would the difference be, right? I mean, uh, yeah. all I know is that Wiley Coyote cartoons are going to be lit. <laughs> like if that's if that's where we're at like bending matter like oh dude wait till yeah. that dude gets the acme catalog in 30 years yeah uh and you know digging through some of this a couple things like did you know do you know you could make a black hole just using light um hold on let me parse that so i guess no 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 i'm i'm not understanding that because because uh if if light is at its most generous, if you uh, take the particle theory, then it's by definition the least massful type of mass conceivable. Um, walk me through this. This this sounds crazy. 
Well, again, all you have to all you have to do is change your frame of reference to remember matter or energy. And if you have uh, light, can have a tremendous amount of energy. So if you take a tremendous amount of light and focus it to one point, you can create a black hole because you're using that energy to warp space. Huh. Hmm. All right, I, th I think that's as far as either Justin and I have on that one. <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's a great one for anybody's curious. Go Google like uh, light, you know, create a black hole with light, or look for YouTube videos. And really eloquent speakers will show you with fancy diagrams and stuff like this. And like, oh, if you do this and da da da, and, and you're like me, like going, oh, okay, I guess you can do this now. <laughs> and I'm gonna tell Justin and Brian, and I'm not got anything else to offer because <laughs> this is just cool. Like I heard for the first time, I had maybe other people heard about this uh, dark fluid. Uh, man, uh, pardon? Whoa, whoa, whoa! whoa. Yeah, I had that right that before I came down with COVID. I was gonna say. <laughs> so the idea is to explain both dark energy and dark matter into one theoretical framework, and we've talked about you know before. If you look at when we look at galaxies forming their sort of whirlpool and holding together, it's like, man, there's something holding these things together that we can't count all of the matter. There's not enough stars there to be able to do this. And people thought maybe it's stars that are dark or whatever, like, no, there should still be more energy. And then the idea that dark matter is the thing holding these things together. But then everything, all these galaxies are being pushed apart. And that's where the idea of this dark energy is this thing that's sort of pushing everything outwards. And then dark fluid is saying, no, it's both. It's uh, I imagine, uh, man, it's like a, it's like a cosmic non-Newtonian fluid where it's just like uh, the same thing that surprises us as children on the beach is, in in my reduced metaphor, is happening on a cosmic scale. No. then there is dark flow. <laughs> okay, uh, and it has to do with the velocity of galaxy clusters. So really, I think anybody wants to do a PhD here, just use the word dark and something cool afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> that is the fastest way to get aggregated by science blogs, right? It's just, yeah. you know. It just make sure that really... your theory sounds like a, a Sith. That's all you really need to do. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it's also like... We're we're in a world where like murder hornets got like a six month run out of it when like I don't even know what they were or whether or not they were an actual problem, but people just like saying the word. Like the the the, the threshold to get coverage is really not all that high. Yeah. So it's but it is it's crazy. If anybody's curious, just go dive down like the a like the dark matter like why did we come up with this and it's not like a scientist are like i want to make up something today it's just you know we're looking at these galaxies like how are they why are they held why are they forming together why are they spinning how are they holding together it's not enough gas not enough stuff that we can observe there's got to be something else there and it's like ah i'm gonna add a little a thing in the equation here called you know dark matter great yeah now we've got dark matter what is it? don't know <laughs> Equation works. <laughs> you know, like, did did you just brand the letter X? <laughs> like, like you just you just you know, drew a circle around the part you don't know and gave it a name. It's like, yes. Try, try it an argument next time. Did you eat all the cookies? Dark matter. What? <laughs> it makes sense. It makes complete sense. The cookies so, are here. Know. They're gone. Dark matter. Yeah, yeah, dark matter. I'm sorry. I'm not gonna have to explain this to you one more time. <laughs> like, it was dark matter. Uh, and and yeah, somebody put in there there be dragons, and you know, like you know, perhaps the territory is the unknown terra incognita. You know, we would put that like, yeah, there's something out here. Like ships don't come back, whatever, and eventually we'll fill in the data. Now we're a little more scientific about it. Like, is it really this green scale dragon you drew on the edge of the map? And like, well, maybe not that. Can you prove it's not? <laughs> yeah. We want to do picks. Yeah, yeah. I got a, I, I got, I got a pick. So I turned uh, a friend of ours, Darren Kitchen, on to a little show that is coming back for a fifth season in a week, uh, and that is The Expanse. The Expanse is good. I've really enjoyed having conversations with Darren about The Expanse, and it's made me very excited for The Expanse. So, just public service announcement: if you ain't never watched The Expanse and you have Amazon Prime. And you enjoy shows like uh, Star Trek, 
and Battlestar Galactica and Game of Thrones. Well, just know that there's a show that tickles all of those parts of your brain just waiting for you. So they recently announced that there's only going to be one more season of The Expanse, and now I'm torn because I fell off around um, season midway through season three, and it's like, do I want to get back on the horse to get all the way caught up just to wait for that one more season, or do I wait and then get to do the whole run-up for that finale? Um, number one, I'll believe that it's their final season when Bezos says that he's done watching the show. Like, I mean, because <laughs> yeah. apparently it's like Bezos' favorite show. So it's like, as long if if they nail a cliffhanger, or they nail something, then I, I can imagine just, ah, six more? The, six more episodes? The, the, Let's just go. The bald, Spin-off? muscular industrialist is about to save the day. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, the, one of the theories that was proposed in the cord killers audience was maybe like this takes you, I believe up through book six ish or something, if I remember correctly, but then the suggestion was, well, maybe they wrap up the TV show and then we get a trilogy of movies afterwards. I, I, I believe that this is going to go on for as long that I, I can't remember a show that is more protected than the expanse is right now <laughs> considering <laughs> where the world of streaming is how rich jeff bezos is yeah. none of these things have done anything but become bigger and 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 more powerful uh, I, I wouldn't be shocked if considering that prime is now a more mature platform that you have all these uh, uh viewers that love the boys which is not a dissimilar demographic that we could see the expanse just hit a new pop culture kind of threshold uh, 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 with, with this season. Not since I station zero played round the clock on a Las Vegas television network yes. station for Howard Hughes. Uh, that's a, that was his favorite show. He bought the local Vegas TV station and just had them play it a lot. Oh, that's amazing. Cause I, yeah, didn't I didn't want to get one- a VCR. Back One then. of the last times I was in Vegas, or maybe I heard it from you, Andrew, just through through all of our our Vegas connections, uh, uh, there are old timers who do swear that they were watching television, and then the movie rewound or like stopped and went back <laughs> because uh, uh, Howard Hughes, who owned the station, called and be like, and was like, "No, play that again," and because he owns it. It was just basically everybody was watching his I VCR. I never heard that. It wouldn't surprise me. I've yeah, there, I've, I've there, heard yeah, heard legend. There is a book to be written on the crazy kind of eccentrics, and it kind of started with Hughes, but you know there are other people there. Like there's one person I won't say, but like their phone number is so funny and unique when you hear it, and it's the only thing like a really rich person who could call up the local telephone company and say. I want you to do this. And they're like, yes, sir, yeah. Mr. We'll make this thing happen. A lot of things like that. It's its own crazy little place. Is it 8008 <laughs> Jenny? Uh, no, 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 no. It was, uh, 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 that's uh, on a calculator. It says boobless. Mm, oh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I, I would, I would say, uh, uh, the expanse, Brian, you should, so what you, you, you tapped out, uh, halfway through that, that weird pocket, uh, uh, they were all stuck in, in, in the, in the universe pocket. Uh, no, I don't even think I made it there. Uh, I think I, I get was that far either. Spoiler alert. Uh, I think it was the part that, um, uh, 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 uh oh, man, um, I, it got, stop me if, if, if this is the entire series, but like it got real tedious and political and then I fell asleep. And then well, when I woke up, my wife was three episodes ahead and I never got caught. <laughs> up. Uh, well, that's funny. Cause I, I think the show is kind of at its best when it is like at its high tension political stuff where it's like we're talking about the the game of thrones conflicts but instead of like the riverlands we're talking about you know the belt or mars or earth or whatever um there's yeah look there there are stops and starts i I think the show is is unique in that it's gone in a few very interesting directions that aren't necessarily congruous with like the whole it feels at times a little disjointed in in the directions that it goes but at the same time uh it's the only game in town selling bsg heroin 
right now. Like, you know, if you remember that time that you were really into BSG heroin, doesn't matter. It ain't the exact same thing, but boy, if you want a bunch of people making decisions on a ship that you believe in, in the stakes, uh, that's it. Awesome. So I, uh, started a new audiobook, new, new jam dropped from, uh, one of my favorite, uh, stoic authors, Gary John Bishop, the guy who wrote, uh, on F word yourself, uh, that I liked very, very much. I probably owe that a re-listen. Um, but man, he's just got this great, uh, uh direct, simple Scottish, uh, accent as he reads his stories uh in his new book is uh is wise as f word and uh i like it quite a bit uh, it's um he he really encourages you to take your time he said um uh look it's a short book so i'm gonna need you to read this real slow uh press pause think about it walk around a bit uh really let these ideas sit with you if you, uh, because uh, and he makes it very clear all this could blow right past you and you'll get nothing out of it. And that would be a dumb waste of, of both of our times. Uh, I like it a lot. It's a thing. I, I would say that something I was disappointed that we haven't seen more of is the shorter book, uh, uh, you know, kind of, there is such a value to here's 120 pages on a thing enough to do deep into it enough to get this point across. How many times have we read books? You're like, Ah, you've made your point, but now you're stretching it out because your publisher wanted 300 words to sell a hardcover. And, you know, people, you look at like on average, like some of the most popular books, people only read like 20 or 30% of them and whatnot, because often you get a feel for it. But also, I don't know. I just, I want short books. I want more shorter books. <laughs> I think, I think what, if, if Andrew were president of the uh, books, uh, he would put forth a, a edict that said, you know, uh, no, unless your biography very specifically like pushes forward either your point or anything, we don't need to hear about the first time your dad bought a television. <laughs> like that's literally just filler to, to inflate the page count. I'm, I'm okay with that. I, when I, I like, but like when I listen to a biography and like, his great great grandfather settled in the Mississippi Valley, you know, selling orange seeds. Unfortunately, they wouldn't grow. But when he went up north, and you're like, holy, I don't think this has any effect on this person at all. I think you no. went to a genealogy place, and you 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 want us to hear all your homework. Um, I I read I read one Barry Goldwater book for the second season of Raise the Dead that literally went back five generations and spent a significant amount of time on the life of each of the five generations of the gold waters that eventually settled in America. And it's like, you really could have boiled it all down to, he had a frontier spirit <laughs> like that. <laughs> that would have, it would have pretty much got you 99% of the way there with a 99% a less words. Yeah. I mean, there's, I Disney one they talked a bit about his father going to the World's Fair or whatever, working there, telling him about. I'm like, okay, I can see how some of the stories there, but like when they get into like the great, you know, early, early family history, like I think there's a lot that happened in his life that we could go into that's maybe harder to find out would take interviews, but you know. uh, I got, I got Who's a pick. next. Uh, I've got a pick. I, I watched this uh, uh, right before, right before the show today, uh, and it was a very sweet little little film. Uh, it's on Hulu. Uh, it's called Happiest Season. Uh, you might have heard a little, little something about this. This is the big. Uh, this is the, it's all the rage on Twitter, right? Yeah, this is the uh, uh, the uh, the holiday uh, kind of rom com uh, uh, family film uh, about uh, about uh, two lesbians who go to one of their family's uh, homes for Christmas, and uh, turns out she's actually not out to her parents, and it is a whole. You know, it, it's kind of everything you would expect uh, from that premise, uh, but it's very, but it's very sweet. It's really well, uh, 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 well directed, well written. Uh, a lot of, a lot of recognizable faces in the cast: uh, Kristen Stewart and Mackenzie Davis. Mackenzie Davis, you might know from uh, *Halt and Catch Fire*, are kind of the lead actresses in it. Alice and Brie is great. Aubrey Aubrey Plaza. Uh, has a good uh, uh, supporting part in it. Uh, uh, Dan Levy as the kind of uh, 
best friend on the phone uh, a, a town away is just fantastic. It's great. It, I, I, I don't want to uh, over overhype it uh, because I, I don't think it's <laughs> even worth that. But as far as like a, a sweet Christmas movie and one that tells a story about, uh, 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 you know, uh, two lesbians, uh, I think I think it's really, uh, uh, really good and really, really kind of heartwarming. So. And uh, a, co-written and directed by Clea Duvall, who she's had an amazing career as an actress. And yeah. so I think that's awesome, you know, just to see, you know, a talented person. Yeah, exactly. So uh, yeah. happiest season on Hulu. I dig it. Andrew? Cool. My pick is uh, I watched last night, I watched Mank, which is the David Fincher movie about... Uh, Herman Mankiewicz, who is a prolific Hollywood screenwriter, was the writer, sort of co-writer of Citizen Kane, depending upon who you ask, you know, how much did you know Orson Welles contribute to the actual writing or not. And Gary Oldman plays Mankiewicz in it, and uh, Gary Oldman is phenomenal. It is told, you know, it's done in a black and white style. It, it's a very neat. Uh, I enjoyed it. Like I'm a big, I'm a big fan of Citizen Kane. I think that it's one of these things. It's just this kind of you know really amazing sort of movie because you sit back not just visually but the way it was done structurally etc and i believe the script for this was written by his by fincher's father jack fincher no good which is kind of awesome so this seems like it's the like uh, in in a bizarre award season year this this would be the leader in the clubhouse for award season right like fincher big name director it's very artistic it's about hollywood which hollywood loves to celebrate yeah um, uh, like it w- w- would you be surprised andrew if this is on on whatever zoom call they're gonna call the oscars this year uh, uh that this cleans up well i mean anytime you put the writer at the virtuous center of hollywood Certainly. Yes. <laughs> uh, that, that's you know, the WGA is going to be up on it. The DGA might be. Uh, we don't know. Like, but uh, I, I, I think that it. The more you understand the, the the more one when you want to watch Citizen Kane before watching this, so you know what the movie's about. And two, the more you've heard about the kind of the history of that. Um, that I think that the there's a lot of little inside sort of stuff. Just helped out a lot by understanding that story, which I think most Hollywood insiders, of course, know. But uh, Oldman is fantastic. Oldman's just, I'm always, you know, to, to say, oh, Gary Oldman was great in this is just, love is what? Is, yeah, is, is to repeat yourself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Has he ever gotten all the performances best are... actor? Has he ever gotten best actor? Um, Gary Oldman? Because I feel like he's... Uh oh wait no he won for Winston Churchill for Darkest yeah. Hour nice yeah you would think that he's a guy that should have got that way sooner I mean, he's just amazing uh but yeah anyhow um so I I recommend it and then I would say for fun go on YouTube and just Google interviews with Orson Welles um. <laughs> I, I, he is an amazing storyteller and he's often as self promoting as he was, larger than life he was. He was also a person who had this inner, sort of this endearing sort of self criticism to himself, too, you know. And I sent, I sent, I was doing some research because there's a story he told, tells about being a kid and meeting Hitler. And their question is, <laughs> did it or did not, did it ever? And it's hard to find out if it did or didn't. Because when he was young, when Orson Welles was young, his 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 dad had a lot of money, but then his family or his his dad had money, but then his mother died and his dad became an alcoholic. And it's sort of by the time he was 16, he just got up and let, went off to Ireland by himself and rode a donkey cart around and then got into theater. But before, when he was early childhood, he had a very interesting early childhood. And so it's hard to know of him. He's got a great story. He tells about uh, trying to raise money at uh uh you know going to you know one of the, the big european film festivals and he's trying to raise money and he had met he says that he'd met winston churchill years earlier where churchill came to see one of his plays and knew all the lines etc and then he's Orson Welles says he's walking through this dining room with this russian financier to you know to get money from and churchill nods to orson wells and the financier was so impressed that he gave wells the funding and then the next day 
Wells says he ran into Churchill at the beach and said, listen, I owe you a debt of gratitude. You helped finance my movie. Thank you so much. And he said, later that night, I'm walking through the dining room with another financier, and Churchill sees me, and he stands up, and he bows. <laughs> <laughs> True, I don't know, but I pulled up this article trying to figure it out. I found this article from The New Yorker in 1938 talking about Orson Welles, okay? And I sent, wow. I sent this to Justin because I'm like, I, yeah, I, I've this not read is, it, yet. it is worth it when you have the time to just sit back and read this thing because – Understand that Orson Welles was 23, 22, 23, and they're talking about the opening of one of his latest plays. You know, this this 23-year-old man, the opening of one of his biggest plays, and it's great and whatnot. And one of the biggest things reporters tried to do back then is they would kept calling. He was born in Kenosha, Wisconsin, is they would call the hospitals and stuff. And they were always trying to get a hold of birth certificates because they were convinced that he had to be in his 30s or 40s. Nobody could believe that this guy who emerged onto the stage at you know 20, 21 as a producer, director, actor was so talented. And kind of hard to live that down later on. Yeah, I mean, yes, yeah, so. such, such an icon. Obviously, a bit of a a a troubled uh, troubled existence in his in his later life, as he you know kind of was the, the definition of not being able to get out of his own way. But uh, yeah, uh, yeah, icon Orson Welles. Yeah, so I think makes an interesting part, a different point of view of the story, and sort of emphasizes Mankiewicz's contributions to that movie. And it goes back to because Mankiewicz, as this is told, knew uh, Hearst. Uh, new uh, Marion Davies, new, you know, that that world and sort of that was where that kind of aspect of the Sism King thing came from and whatnot. And so uh, well worth watching. I'm pumped. Cool. Right on. Gentlemen, it's been weird. Weird fluid. Weird, dark, dark, <laughs> weird fluid. matter. Weird, I'm weird. Weird out. energy. Weird times. Oh, Dark time? Dark time has to be a thing, right? Dark time. I'm with that. Hey. Hey. There we go. Everybody, good show. Hey. hey. All right. Dark orbits. Yeah. Dark fusion. Dark time. Darks. Dark stars. Dark. Dark. Dark molecules. Bing duck. Dark meat. Dark meat. Dark meat. <laughs> uh, all right, we're gonna take a uh, few minutes here and get ready for after things. If anyone needs to take a break, now yeah. to do so. Get that soda. Get it. Get it. Hey, uh, Bryce. Hi. Now that these jokers have cleared the hell out. <laughs> Always. Always. How um, you doing? What's going on, man? I couldn't get out of my own way this morning. You ever had one of them mornings where you just can't get out of your own way? Just really? nothing's going right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What happened? Well, uh, so I wake up, I go for my run, and for the the sanctity of the podcast, I'm just gonna let everybody know I had stomach troubles. Oh no! Um, so that was started things off on just a bad foot, and then. Come back, do my workout, start working on the PX3 Extra this morning. Forget totally that I have a uh, podcast interview that I have to do that I had scheduled. And so, like, I'm 10 minutes late for that. So now I'm, like, all the time that I thought I had allocated for the podcast, I didn't look at my online calendar. And so my online calendar and my physical calendar were different. Blah, 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 blah. Go, I do that. And then I have to jam all the work I was going to do in the, in the PX3 extra into a shorter amount of time, rush through that, get on here. And, and you want to know what I, I, I feel like, uh, uh maybe now we're stabilizing we're past but, it. But boy, this morning, did mm. I just feel like it was, uh, just, uh, just not what, what not your old boy gerbs is morning. You know, it's gonna, it's gonna happen. You know, mistakes happen. Uh, it sounds like you powered through it and managed to make, Managed to, to get most everything done. Uh, uh, We're here now. That's yeah, all that matters. Right We're here now. Uh, if you need to go get a drink, Justin, that'd be a time. No, I'm fine. Brian, how was your morning? Uh, so far, so good. I, I woke up early because I had a meeting, which meant that if I was going to make this meeting, I had to wake up so early if I wanted to get my workout in that I had to set an alarm. 
So I set an alarm to wake up early so I could work out, so I could be here for the meeting that everyone reminded me was at 10 a.m. Get up, get up here, set everything up, open up the calendar. Invite clearly says 10 Pacific time, noon central. So everybody uh, who's here in the central time zone who is telling me that don't, don't forget 10, that, that very yeah. early meeting, yeah. uh, not so much. But I ended up getting other things done. I genuinely think that there is a real, like, there's a real learner's curve to just being a calendar person. Like, cause I've, I've, one thing that the pandemic has happened has, in my life is that I, I have become more of a planner calendar person guy, but man, is it like, does it take a, a lifestyle commitment? Uh, because like I have, I've previously in working with Andrew and working with other fields, I very much had a, like, uh, 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 here's a pile of stuff that has to be done today go like that's that's kind of been my 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 lifestyle but like the more you get into it you start laying stuff out and and things like that happen brian where it's like oh it was this and we're scheduling it across time zones and the number that got stuck in my head is not the number that actually exists and so now you're doing stuff it really is just a pain in the butt uh i i i'm actually pretty good at calendar stuff uh there are two entries on there both labeled that same meeting one was the actual one. The other was inserted who by someone. Who put the other one in? Some, someone, someone in this time zone who, oh, who booked the meeting. Son of a bee. Son <laughs> of a bee. Oh, so you just got hoodwinked. That wasn't even, ding, that ding, wasn't ding, even, ding, yeah. Ding, yeah ding, ding. It's like, like yeah. uh, hey man, don't forget, it's definitely this earlier than usual meeting. And I'm sorry this meeting's so early. Uh, I know you normally work out during that time. And I'm like, okay, well, that's the kind of thing you say when, when you... Definitely know what time the meeting is. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, okay? Uh, <laughs> oh, no! no! I don't know. I don't know what it is. Um, I'm saying, like, man, this is the most passive-aggressive thing <laughs> no, I've ever no. seen. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, do, uh, before we get into weird things, do we have any time uh, constraints today? I got a hard out at one. So if it gets close to it, I mean, I got like a hard out at like yeah. one fifty or twelve fifty seven. So if I just go Irish goodbye, uh, okay, we can yeah, yeah. let's let's jump in then. All right, I will. Well, uh, he's got a what is that? A combo? You mean a combo? Ritz cracker with cheese, beef jerky, beef jerky, uh, meat stick. Mm. Uh, yeah. <laughs> of course <laughs> gotta get the podcast juice out everybody people don't know they only yeah. listen to the podcast they don't know about the podcast juice and having to empty the valve i'm sorry everybody i apologize <laughs> it's unprofessional of me all right all right i'll catch you in for after things in three two hello and welcome to after things i'm andrew main joined by justin robert young hi friends Mr. Brian Brushwood. Hello, hello. And Mr. Bryce Castillo. Oh, I'm I'm back here. Hello. <laughs> so I want to talk about uh, actually health and fitness stuff. I want to talk to you guys because you're all trying different stuff into different things. I uh, I realize that as I get older, I probably need to be paying more attention to things, and because um, as you get older, things break down, mm -hmm. fall apart. Since when? Uh, look at Sir Isaac Newton over here claiming that the body decays to entropy. What's next? Yes. You're gonna say your body's a, a closed system? Well, I made I made the decision to actually try to commit to an Apple Watch. Like I uh -oh. have like I have like several Apple Watches sitting in drawers. I'm like, oh, I'll just buy the latest one of cellular and all that and stick it on my wrist and just shut up and try to keep it. Um, that's when. I got this new heart rate monitor, this like uh, blood pressure meter uh, device that's like super cool. You put this on your arm, you press a button, and it syncs up with your phone whenever. Oh, cool. Which 
yeah, that's cool. So like, I don't know. I'm like, I've got to figure out my problem is this. And I don't, it's really only special to me. I don't think anybody else has gone through this. My lifestyle most of this year has changed where I'm a lot much more sedentary and don't go to as many places. Really? Mm. Mm-hmm. So uh, I don't walk near anywhere nearly as much as I used to. I'm nowhere near as active that, as I was before. That part is actually harder for me to believe because I would have, I would imagine that that uh, there's still plenty of places you could walk that are safe to do so. And I know that that you really enjoy long, prolonged walks and do most of your writing during that. But 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 it sounds like I mean I'm I'm not calling you a liar, but but uh, right. uh, yeah, you're a big liar. But he's how saying, much, is what he's saying? It Shut must up be significant lies, if, liar face. if 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 the most uh, prodigious walker I know is talking about how little he's been able to walk. Uh, the job, the new job, that was a big part of it. Yeah. Was the fact that working for deciding like, oh, this would be a fun, neat experience. And all of a sudden we talked about in our last show about all of a sudden your calendar falls up and it's like, boom, calendar. Yeah. And it's like, ah, the time of day that I normally do this is no longer there. And so, um, and it's up to me to adjust. And that's the thing is I've always, I've been a person that functioned most of my life. The only time I ever had to set an alarm was Mondays for this show. Ha. <laughs> And now every day, and the, also that goes with it is is the time. So it's a big adjustment, still adjusting. Yeah, we were uh, we were talking in the pre-show about uh, adjusting to calendar life. Um, weirdly, I used to live my whole life per the calendar in four hour blocks constantly because I was never four hours away from either getting on stage, needing to be in a hotel bed, or or getting to a flight or whatever. Um, and it's only been as as we've got more established in one place that that there was a couple of years that the calendar just sort of decayed into not really meaning much and during the pandemic there really is i mean everybody's throwing these zoom meeting calendar items left and right and it's so easy to just click yeah sure i'll be there and then future you has to show up and be all like oh i guess past me said i would go to this thing yeah yeah, that's the thing. I I mean, I enjoy it. Like, I'm glad I'm in. I'm where I'm now because my fear. I've talked about this. I don't know how much here, but I remember when I first moved into my townhouse. My magic business was comfortable enough that it was supporting me. I could kind of go out to eat, you know, be a single guy and enjoy, you know, not having to have a lot of responsibilities. But I remember the moment my realtor gave me the key to the townhouse and I had my furniture put in there, and I walked in and I set my key down on a table and it was like that Battlestar Galactica flash forward one year later, I'm walking through the door and I set my keys down and an entire year had gone by. And, and that terrifies me is that, is that I get so complacent in my life that I have years that I can't account for because I just didn't do anything out of the ordinary or whatever and not didn't interact with people as much. And when this opportunity came up, uh, work with some really, amazing people those who know i work with open ai now helping them with some stuff and that was awesome but also comes with that the commitment it's not just yeah i'll show up if i want to no no yeah apparently Other you gotta be there turns out you gotta be when there. everybody bothers to have a meeting <laughs> they, they're not doing it just for themselves so then yeah. so then andrew with that new responsibility uh, uh you you now have the apple watch like how are you trying to carve out time for that like for exercise and stuff, um, yeah, poorly. <laughs> I, I'm. It has been that. Oh, I'll get to this, and then also like me. Oh, I want to build. I want to get this thing done. I want to get this thing done by this. I want to do this other thing and get it done. And the next thing I know, I look like, oh, it's one a.m. and uh, maybe I should have planned my time better. So I'm trying. Um, I'm trying to do like you know, getting out, running, and then uh, VR stuff. That's what I like too. Is VR is great because you can just hop in there for thirty minutes or something and play a game that keeps you pretty active. Oh, cool. so you you and you and Bryce need to need to need to sync up as like yeah. video game workout people because you guys are, are are both on that click. Yeah, my I, I have friends that do that a lot. Total like Beat Saber workout junkies. Beat Sa- and Beat Saber. Uh, Beat Saber seems like the exact same kind of. Uh, uh, not pro- I'm going to say problem because I, I don't have a better word for it, but it has the same problem as the stuff that I do, which is like uh, like I got uh, a DDR foam pad a f- like a month or so ago now, 
and it's great and it, and i can hook it up to my computer and i can play all the custom songs and stuff but that's a leg workout it's not a full body arm anything or before that i was doing uh the just dance games on the switch and you use the remote but that is the rem- it's tracking the remote it's not tracking your body mm-hmm. so it's really just how much you move your right arm and so a lot of that is like getting the wiggles out and either making that experience a a full body experience right engaging the the unused part of your body or or finding other other works other exercises to do to kind of make sure you're not overtaxing or 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 uh you know overdoing it but i think video games are a great entry point uh the i got the ring switch ring fit ring fit adventure uh mm-hmm. last year or so ago um and that was great that's that's uh that's a that's a whole thing. They give you a little yoga uh, yoga ring, I think is what they call it, and you put one of the controllers in there, and it it knows when you're squeezing it, and it knows, you know, you put it between your legs, and you do it this, and yet it's a, and it's an RPG in the middle of it. So, uh, or you could just do the exercises. Like I th- I think it's a really accessible way to to get. There are a lot of really accessible at home ways to to keep active. Yeah, I, I you know it was fun. It was like there was a pistol whip i don't know if you guys ever played that game which is uh an awesome shooter game rhythm shooter in vr where you're basically you're moving through this it's like john wick meets matrix or whatever and the graphics are cool the music's great and they've added a new new version a new uh campaign to it called pistol Whip 2089 which is a little story campaign where you're shooting at robots and stuff and it's one of these things where you look at it, like, oh, it's kind of cool, but when you play it, it's really fun because you're moving forward and you're just shooting at things as they come at you. And uh, we're looking at a video here of this thing where you know guys pop out of anywhere, wherever you're at. And Oh, and this is the one where it, shoot, like, it shoots on the beat or uh, like you you're... try to sh- you get higher scores if you shoot on the beat. Yeah, I don't even I just try to shoot them. I don't even worry about the beat. <laughs> but uh, it, they, they added this layer to it. And one level you don't have you can't shoot and you just got to literally pistol whip everybody as you go through there. And that was a great workout. I'm like, I'm like, oh, I'll just play this. I'm going whack, 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 whack. I'm like, <laughs> at the yeah. end of it. Or even so, like we we sports. If you still got if you still get your Wii or Wii U somewhere around there, get the, mm-hmm. get those remotes out. Get, I got get a switch test. somewhere, but yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So it, for me, it needs variety. That's the biggest thing for me is I need to have sort of variety. But I'm curious, what other apps, what other tools, what other things like that have worked for everybody else? Um, something that doesn't work really well is any of those reminder apps, like. Tell me how often in your life you've ever been in the middle of doing something on a computer and your nagging housewife of a wristwatch said, hey, man, why don't you get up and move a little bit? And then you thought to yourself, I'm so thankful for that reminder. What a great nudge. Watch. I'll make sure to do that right now. Uh, So far, zero times has that happened. And instead, Mm. instead, just at random ass times, I'll get up and go to the bathroom and be like, way to way to get up and move around man and i'm just like it's so patronizing and dumb and i i i never I, like those i i i think that it is very bad that it's a one size fits all thing because i have complained about that i have your exact take on this but i have had people tell me like oh no it actually is really it's it it it's a good reminder when i'm just sitting there on the computer all day uh, and I, and I'm uh, I need to get up and it, it's worth it. it it's a, it, an excuse for me to take a little lap around the apartment or back when we had offices around the office. Uh, that being said, the stupid stand goal on <laughs> the Apple no! Watch is the bane of my existence. When I'm racking up like a thousand calories burnt, like uh, fifty minutes of what they consider exercise. Uh, and, and I'm not matching my stand goal because I haven't stood. It's the, it's the little blue ring when I don't, cl- when I don't close all three rings because of the stupid stand goal, because I was apparently standing at the wrong times that it's not that you stand for X amount of time per day. It's that you stand one minute for 12 hours in each hour in a yeah. day. And it's, it's just Oh my God! Do I want to rip the, the concept of 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 the stand? I will. I will say though, sky. Uh, I yes, 
It sucks. Yes, it's not cool having the thing say, you need to stand up. You've been on the couch for three hours watching uh, uh, watching YouTube videos. You need to stand up. Um, it sucks. And also, it works. I think it does work uh, in terms of uh, trying to make in, sure you In you're... terms of making you look like you're the body of Justin Robert Young. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, like, uh, I like video games. I think the video games are great. Who wants to watch my marbles stream? I yeah. love marbles, man. Look at me. Uh, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> but, but I do think it... Like, I, I think it... Look, it's easy to it's easy to lay around all day. Uh, the other thing is uh, with the new I O or the new Watch OS that came out earlier this year or a few months ago, you can now adjust those goals too. Because um, I know like uh, like there was an interesting weird uh, a use case of like oh uh, like truckers like long haul truckers won't get twelve hours. A lot of them just there will be days where they just won't have the opportunity to stand up an hour every hour. Um, but now you can adjust. Not just the calories, but also your exercise minutes, how many exercise minutes and how many stand minutes uh, you should do in a day. But I I I I, I also agree it's the it's the hardest one to get over because it's just it's, you no, know, it just when it stops when I the <laughs> other two are hard. The other two take effort. The other two, you gotta make sure that you are carving time out of your day to hit the move goal and to hit the exercise goal. Uh the the stand one is just like I feel like it's there to give people the first win like the idea is well i can at least hit the stand goal i can i can commit to standing uh but boy boy is it infuriating stand when you do all the hard stuff stand goal sounds like one of the first things somebody blurted out in the pitch meeting everyone agreed was dumb as hell and then three days later with coffee cups and starbucks and crumpled papers and whiteboards that are scribbled over five times just somebody goes Screw it. Stand. Third ring will be stand. Remember, <laughs> remember when Tim Cook talked about it? He was like, sitting is the new smoking. <laughs> and it's yeah. like, we've been sitting for a long time, Tim. And I believe that like sitting for too long is bad, but he was like, it's the new smoking. <laughs> it's like, I mean, like, I, 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 sitting. Yeah. And, and look, I, I think that it's the chair doctors certainly... sit on most. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I prefer this chair. It activates my T cells. It's uh, perfectly fine to sit while pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, she has sitting as fetal syndrome. No, yeah. Stephen Hawking <laughs> sat his whole life. <laughs> my grandfather sat every day, and he lived to 102 <laughs> on filtered chairs. Uh, so yeah. Uh, 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 I don't know. Uh, by and large, I'm okay with the fitness tracking. It, my my, I'm happy because I am hitting the goals. I'm giving it data. I still quite don't know what the hell it means. Like uh, aside from being an internal motivation of like, oh well, I should do this or I should do that. But then again, it's like if I'm getting out and working out every single day, then I've found myself less uh, uh, motivated by the rings. It's like, if I don't hit the rings, I'm like, screw you. It's your fault rings. It's not my fault. I'm, I'm actually going out there and doing stuff every day. You're just a stupid computer program. Why are you so stupid? Um, stop hitting yourself. Stop hitting yourself. Stop hitting yourself. <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, uh, I don't know. It's, it's, it's okay. I just wish that there was a better, like for all the, the push notification, here's what you should do. I wish there was like an interactivity thing in the health monitor where it'd be like, oh, so it seems like based on your pattern, uh, based on your patterns, you're doing X, Y, and Z. Have you considered based on noted health trends or, or whatever that like these are apps that might plug in well to your lifestyle? This is what you should do. This is maybe you should try to hit these goals. Like there, there's so much data being poured into it that I, I have sometimes wonder exactly what it's for. Hmm. Well, and I, I'm I, sure there's there's enough suits at Apple who are saying, we definitely can't just give people fitness advice and have them keel over and sue us for a million things. But I, but I do think there, there's a lot of good compatibility with the apps that are out there. But you're right. It's not easy to find ones that you want. It's I think it's an evolving sort of thing. And part of it is because of what they have to go through to get approval for doing stuff is, you know, because any kind thing kind of health related takes a while. Uh, I think they kind of have a larger goal of, you know, like they just added the, you know, the, they added an 
they had an EKG to the thing. I mean, yep. that's incredible. Yep. Like, I mean, it's got an EKG in there. And I saw patent stuff where they figured out a way to like do blood pressure. You know, you might need yeah. another like device or something, but they're working on all sorts of incredible stuff that you can get on there because, you know, their goal is to make it into this, you know, super sort of like when we read books about the system that's monitoring your health and doing that, that's what they want to get to. Yeah, I, I, I think that there's... I don't blame them per se. This is really just a a writ large uh, issue that I've had with the kind of quantifiable self movement that we've seen with all the trackers over the past, you know, what, five to seven years that we're great. We've never been better at getting all the numbers. And we're, to me, we're sitting on these silos of grain and not knowing how to bake bread. Like we, we, we don't know how to take it to that next level. Yeah. I think, you know, well, oh, please. Uh, well, like the, um, th they do have uh, in the health app, if you've got the Apple Watch, uh, your trends. So like uh, if you are, how you are trending. So like my uh, exercise is trending up, but my walking pace is trending down because I haven't done as much walking exercises versus just the indoor cardio stuff. But uh, even this is very like, they don't they don't ever tell you, hey, you're trending up, you are doing better, um, or you should you should be working on these things, you know. Uh even even when they have this thing here, it feels like it's maybe not enough. Yeah, I think that there's a lot of there the third party integration's great though, the ability like like I said, I got this, you know, the blood pressure monitor that's got Bluetooth and Wi Fi that you do use it and then it'll update whenever and you open up your app and open up my health app and all of a sudden it's got the data from there. Things like that are great. I think they're doing a lot of stuff to help uh, people with, you know, conditions and stuff. And it, it is this, they're trying to find this balance between what they can do, what they can get approval for, how it kind of all works together, which is kind of the approval it's so thing complicated. is really interesting. The idea that I mean, you of course don't want people to go all willy nilly, but but man, what a fine line we're we're walking. Where it's like nobody's really owning the fact that people are using things for health related purposes because they can't claim that it's a health device to measure your heart rate or whatever. So instead, it's like what a fun novelty it is to know how many beats we think your heart is beating at, and that's that's all we're gonna say about that. Um, so I, I, I don't know what the answer is, um, but, uh, but it is, it is weird to see very clearly them selling all this and calling, you know, sections of the watch health and so on, but refusing to accept kind of any responsibility for, 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 uh, for, uh, in any substantive way. I, I, you know, they've got, I think there are probably more doctors working for Apple now on the technology and trying to figure out what's safe and what they can. And then. You know, again, what what you can get approved from the FAA, what you can do, because if you like you to do anything, you have to read through these dis disclaimers, and it's like, it's. I think they want to get more into that space because it's such a big space. Launching Apple Fitness, you've seen this. Yeah, Fit Apple Fitness Plus, their video courses. Uh, yeah, I, Apple I'm video course, interested yeah. in this. I would certainly at least try this out. The idea is, uh, it's on. Uh, you need an Apple Watch. Um, and another Apple device, like an Apple TV or an iPhone, and you'll do the exercise with the video, and it'll even show you your like all your stats on the screen as you're doing it, and it'll has music integration, so you can get the playlists and stuff like that. Mm. I'd be willing to try that. I know Nike has a similar thing already, um, Fit Fitness Club, I think, um, and and there's like Peloton and stuff, but it's interesting. Yeah, everybody's getting yep. into that space. Everybody and and I think it's a smart move for Apple because they already have the things, the equipment, right? They're just selling the the service where Peloton wants you to buy the bike, and so they can give you all the other stuff. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I I think ultimately fitness is such a personal journey for people that there there really is no one size fits all solution other than are you doing it or are you not and 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 the, yeah. the process that gets you there is different for everybody that's the hard part too because like i remember going to the doctor and listening to a a nurse give me advice and she's overweight yeah. and <laughs> and and i don't want and i'm like i get it i understand that but 
you know, I used to drive by the hospital where I lived and I would see doctors and nurses and orderlies out back smoking. And I'm like, if these things, if you can't follow your own advice, how we need to find better ways. We need to find better tools and systems and maybe it's fit rings and things like this. And who knows? We need to find better things because just telling a person doesn't even work when they are medical professionals. And yeah. And, and like, I think that the the human body especially when it comes to physical fitness is so tied to your motivation it's so tied to your own unique uh you know makeup that you know when i first started to have my back uh stuff the advice they gave me was to stop working out and stop walking and i i think stopping lifting was probably a good idea ultimately the reason why i had my back stuff was largely i think stress induced and stopping walking i think genuinely tacked on maybe anywhere between three to six months of me readjusting once I had greater mobility to kind of getting back to where I needed to be. And I do think that if I were told, Hey, no, just try to get out there and, and be more active as opposed to just laying in bed and being sad and, and fat, like, uh, then I, I it would have recovered better. It, motivation is so much a key to life in general, but for physical fitness, like, boy, does it have to be a self fulfilling reward or it will just, for at least for me, it will, it will not stick. I need, I need the process to be the reason why I am doing it. And, uh, uh, otherwise, uh, boy, am I smart enough to realize that I could be doing something else that I'm going to really, really, really think is very important. And it's, it's, it's like my girlfriend has an incredible amount of willpower and she's real, by the way, in case anybody's wondering, <laughs> um, she has her Fitbit, which she loves and I will be here and I'll hear pace, 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 pace. So she'll be getting in her footsteps in our two bedroom apartment and yeah. she'll be like, she looked up, oh, I got to get up and walk and I will hear her and she'll every single day on top of the exercise and she does. And I'm like, ah, oh, should I go out and walk? Like, uh, I can't find my sweater. <laughs> yeah. I think I'll stay in. And you know, uh, uh, speaking on motivation, Justin, like that's why, like I'm doing the stuff that I'm doing, which is like dance focused and games focused because it's it's fun, right? Yeah. Uh, and so, like when like to do all the DDR stuff, like it's no small task. I have to like move my coffee table. I have to roll. I have to literally roll up the rug in my living room. Um, uh, 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 and then put it out and hook up the computer and hit all these buttons and all this stuff. But when I do it, it's fun. And I can, whether I'm doing it for, you know, 30 minutes just to finish the watch for the day, or if I'm trying to do for a couple of hours just to, to, to have fun, whatever, like, uh, I wouldn't do that if it was like a rowing machine. I wouldn't like have that. Oh, this is also fun if it was, you know, a, a, a press, you know, a press bar. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think that, Wherever you're getting it, wherever, like, there's there's kind of, at least in my journey over this crazy year where I've, I've become far more physically fit than I, I had previous, there's kind of two levels to it. There's the mechanism of, am I doing a thing? And how often am I doing a thing? And once you get to there and you start to see results, the second level then becomes, well, all right. I'm congratulations. I'm now in the car. I'm driving. I know what it takes to do this. So where do I want to go? And, and that's where to me, now you have the second level motivation to be like, Oh, well, let me try these exercises that I might not be good at. Let me try these things that might seem crazy or whatever. Or on the other hand, say like, Oh, well maybe I don't need to be doing all this kind of stuff. Like once, the, the weight has kind of come to where I think is a, a good and healthy place, then maybe I want to think about other elements of it. And I, I think that there's just so much of, uh, of all this that is just so personal. And, and whenever anybody tries to offer their, you know, uh, markings on their own journey, I think on some level it's helpful to understand for other people that there is a journey, but, boy, do I think one-to-one -one stuff is just uh, to think like, oh, well, this person's there, so I should be there, or, or I should do this, or this really was something that, that they really responded to. That is as unique as a fingerprint to me. Yeah, it's getting comfortable with the exercise 
And so you can, whether you have a sketch out a plan or if you take it by, uh, you know, day by day, you, it, it's, you can tell it's working when you're, when you're stepping up to the thing and you're like, okay, today I'm going to do something like this. And you are able to feel comfortable tailoring it to you, whether that's you're out jogging, how long you're going to jog, if you're going to do interval stuff, if you're going to try at speed, hit a pace or, or whatever, like, like that's, that's where I've gotten to this past, I guess, year now almost of, of getting into fitness stuff. And it's just about building that comfort so that you can, you can feel like you are a part of it and not just at church, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, um, uh, that'll, that'll probably do it unless we have any last thoughts on, uh, on health and fitness. Uh, yeah, just try literally anything. Uh, if, if, if go from zero to something and then you could join the, the ranks of the smug people like us who <laughs> have opinions on what works and what doesn't. Yeah. What's, what's the advice? Get, get workout clothes and just put it on. Yeah. Yeah. Quite uh, because the, the moment you do, you'll feel silly. Not like, well, I put it on like, like just don't, don't make the rule that you have to do anything. Just, just promise to put on workout clothes. Yeah. Yeah. Alrighty, well, that'll do it here for after things today. Just, uh, Andrew had to run off to a meeting, but uh, thank you, everybody, Brian, Justin, Andrew. Yeah, it's been after. See ya. Hey, there we go. All cool. Right. Cool. All right. I'm gonna See you go in an hour. Make food. See you in an hour. Bye. <laughs> That's right. Uh, uh, happy hour coming back in uh, in about an hour, and we got Ayaz on Cord Killers today. So, uh, more stuff coming to you here at twitch.tv slash night attack. Everybody, tune in. And thank you. Cause it's always something. Say that you want me when I'm in the room. And when I ask you, tell me it's too soon. Guess all your words were too good to be.